on today's episode of To Be Determined, I've got my good buddy, Todd Webb, who has drawn the Mr. Toast comics for the last number of years. Um, in this interview, we start at his very beginning as a little kid and explore his love and fascination with comic books and comic strips and watch as this young kid grows up into a teenager and starts on his journey into being a comics creator. I'm here with Todd Webb, cartoonist extraordinaire, who um, I've known for many years, and uh, Todd has drawn many Mr. Toasts, <laughs> comics and otherwise. Um, all I do is draw Mr. Toast. <laughs> all I do. I keep him chained to a desk. <laughs> I've let him out, given him some raw meat. Um, so uh, let's just start with the standard question. Where did you grow up? Uh, mostly in New England. So okay. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. And then uh, we lived in Windsor. Well, we lived in Windsor Locks, Connecticut when I was little. Um, then when I was going into like second grade, we moved to Massachusetts. I was in Westfield, Massachusetts for elementary school. And all of elementary school you were in? Yeah, till I got out of sixth grade. And then seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, we lived in Arizona, nice. uh, just outside of Phoenix. And then we went back to Connecticut to Windsor. And I was in Windsor until I moved to Virginia. And so you uh, are a comic book artist. Um, what was your first interaction with comics? Uh, I was trying to think about this today. Um, I know Peanuts was was big for me early on. Um, and I dug, I told you I had it and I dug it out. I don't know if you want to show and tell already. Yeah, yeah do, we can always do show and tell. Show and tell is always have, the best. I have this still. Oh, okay. Is, this was my first Peanuts collection when I was, I don't know if I, like, kindergarten, maybe. First and grade. Can you, do you have any idea where that might have come from? Yeah, it came from the, it was discarded from the Windsor Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> and i mean how would how would you have how would you have come into how would you, that have ended up ended up in your hands that's some early todd art right there oh my god the the michelangelo yeah scribbling out the stamps on the back yeah um yeah i guess one of my parents probably gave it to me probably no. my dad um yeah so as you can tell i read the covers off of it like i take like they're taped back on that's you nice know. Um, so this, and then the other thing that I had forgotten about, um, until contemplating it was, uh, He-Man toys had mini comics inside the toys. Uh, okay. So I collected all of those. Like, yes. I like, I like the toys, but I had, I had, I, and I had it for years. I think somebody stole it from my house when I had roommates. Cause like I would go off on tour and I'd come back and just random stuff would be missing. Sure. And I, I had a, like a, um, a plastic Ziploc baggie that had all of the He-Man comics, like the mini comics in them, which I think were all by like DC guys and stuff. Okay. Um, I, I can't remember who actually did all those. It was, you know, goofy work for hire stuff, but those were like little tiny, you know, four page, six page mini comic things in full color, which is pretty crazy to think about. Now, Maybe. did you, did you keep them I mean, were the figures like a p real part of your childhood too? Oh Yeah. Yeah, I, those those were the toys that I got. Like there was other toy. Like I liked other stuff, but like the He Man were the ones that were like accessible to my parents, I guess. And so that's sure. what I got. So I had I had He Man toys. Like I had Castle Grayskull, and I had oh. all of them. And I I actually kept them. Um, my He Man toys I I kept in a life size R two D two toy box. Um, okay. I, I, it was so big, like I could climb into it, you know, like it was like a full size, like the same size Kenny Baker probably was climbing into. And um, that's foreshadowing because I used to see Kenny at comic shows. <laughs> but like, um, so I kept all of my He-Man toys in that toy box for my entire life. And then um, a couple of years ago, when my parents were moving from New England to Virginia, they called and they were like, the only stuff of yours we have in the house is this R2-D2 full of toys. Like, what do you want us to do with it? 
Because when my dad and you guys have already talked about this, the thing about the parents throwing out stuff, you know, yeah. collectibles, and that happened to my dad, and so he was like, "We will never throw out any of your stuff unless you tell us to." <laughs> and so I didn't want to throw them out, but I didn't want them either because I didn't have room for them. Sure. But I have I have a buddy in um, Philadelphia who was in. He used to be in that. There's a band called Elf Power out of Athens, Georgia, and he he moved from Georgia up to Pennsylvania and he collects toys and he makes like, um, he'll like customize them and stuff and do things. But he, I emailed him and he bought my entire, he loves star Wars stuff. So he was excited about the toy box, but he, he bought all of the, he, like everything that was in it, like all the kind of, like, he's like, how much do you want? And I was like, I don't care. Like just whatever, <laughs> like just cover my gas and I'll bring it to you. And so he basically paid me gas money and I, I drove up to hang out with him for a weekend on, um, well, I went up to Connecticut and got it, and then I yeah. drove back down and stopped in Philly to hang out, spend the night, and you know we went through them all and moved around. So he has my whole He-Man collection, and um, since then he sent me a picture of um, there was like a museum up there, and he got he had a little exhibit, and it was all my childhood toys were like in a museum, and so I was like that is the best outcome for those toys. Um, the only ones that I I didn't sell him was I, I my dad really liked. Battle Cat, sure. Uh, so my dad has Battle Cat in his office, um, <laughs> and I kept Orco. Oh, uh, of course. So I've got Orco, and I still <laughs> have I still have the little zip string for him too, so I can take him out in the kitchen and let him rip if I get really really bored and crazy from lockdown stuff. But yeah, so um, so yes, the toys toys were important. <laughs> now, were you watching <laughs> like pictures of me with all the toys like? Stand, standing on the you know uh, I'll find it for you at a later time but yeah. there's she she's got pictures of me with like all of them standing up around Castle Grayskull and stuff you know <laughs> like when I was in like I don't know probably first grade or something wow <laughs> now now were you watching the cart the the cartoons yeah I watched all those cartoons but I remember I didn't I don't retain them like I know I watched those I know I watched Transformers. I know I watched Thundercats, Centurions, uh, all that stuff that was on that was just like bad t- mask, like just stuff that was literally designed to sell toys. Yes. Um, which you know I've I've since found out that He Man kind of started that. I goes the first toy line that didn't have a show or something. Was like. it? I think what? it was the first one that was made like they made the shows to as commercials basically like the toy Yeah, toy. I, I think they sort of sort of grew up at the same, you know, they were like yeah. designing the toys and then designing the the show at the same but time. I, I think He-Man started that trend of like using the cartoons as just commercials. <laughs> but the fact that it had like the comics and stuff t- too like it was neat cuz it gave them you know, little story like you knew Beyond just being like a good guy and a bad guy, it was like, yeah, there's like they had little interactions in the comics and stuff, and that was kind of neat. And were the comics as important as the cartoon? Did they? Did, oh, I like the comics more than the cartoon because I I kept them. You know, like I I remembered them. I remember I can still picture the artwork in my head. Like some of them had really decent drawings for hack work, basically. <laughs> you know, like those guys were just collecting paychecks. <laughs> You know, no, no disrespect, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But, you know, that's not they probably weren't thinking of it as great art by any means. They're like, this is great. I'm getting money from Mattel. You know? And those those probably were very good paychecks compared to a lot of other paychecks. You know, yeah, they wouldn't be probably fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you're he man. You're doing you're doing the the toy stuff, and you're you're also reading the Sunday comics. Sunday comics came later. Oh, okay, I was I, that was when I was I was a little bit older. I'm still in elementary school, but we didn't. Okay. Once we got the paper, and I learned that there were comics in the newspaper too. Um, that became the thing, and then it, by that time, Calvin and Hobbes had started. Like oh. prob- probably right when Calvin and Hobbes started was, you know, when that lined up. So then it was Peanuts and Calvin and Hobbes were the two that I gravitated towards. Got it. 
And, and did a, you did you were you da- yeah, daily and Sunday just all of it? We we didn't have the daily paper. I think we only had Sunday paper. Mm. So it was just and we didn't always have it either. Like it was like it was sporadic. I I, I don't know why. I'd have to ask my parents why the newspaper was so <laughs> random. But um, when we got it, I kept you know I would cut out the Calvin and Hobbes Sunday pages and save those. And I. I still have some of those somewhere I found when I was like doing house cleaning and I couldn't bring myself to get rid of it. So, oh, sure. I think I, th- I think I have like the very last strip even like cut out somewhere. And when did you start actually putting pencil to paper and, and thinking about that? That was instant. Like as soon as I instant. could, as soon as I could hold stuff, I was drawing stuff and my dad drew, um, when I was little, um, my dad was drawing. He had a he had a comic strip in his college paper, I think. Oh wow! Because um, he he was always drawing stuff, and he was in bands up until I was born, and um, so I kind of accidentally forced him to grow up, I guess. <laughs> but but, um, but when I was really little, he would still be like he would sit out and draw, and I would sit and try to copy what whatever he was drawing, which I he usually did like fantasy stuff, and then. Um, when my parents uh, got into the uh, the church, and so then he, you know, his drawings, he did like some religious theme drawings and stuff. So, but I I remember sitting and trying to draw what my dad was drawing um, when I was really really little, and uh, and then you know like that peanuts thing. It's like this was I would just try I would copy these things and just try to draw stuff and try to draw Calvin and Hobbes, and um, when I when I was really little, comic strips was the like I was like cartoon like that's a job you know it's like as soon as I grasped what jobs were and like I was like so a grown up does <laughs> you know like this is a grown up going to work and their work is making like Charlie Brown that is the job that I want <laughs> how do I get that job <laughs> and what what age would you think you were thinking like that. Oh, I was I was you know second and third grade. Like I was li- I was a little kid when I wanted to be a cartoonist. Like as soon as I found out it was a thing, that's that's that was my goal forever <laughs> was mm. cartooning. And in my in my mind that meant comic strips, which was a weird mysterious thing because I could never figure out how to make a comic strip like a functional one. Like I like when I was at that stage, you know, like my comics never went anywhere. There was never any recurring characters. There was never, you know, like I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. Like you'll see interviews with other cartoonists who knew that what that's what they wanted to do. And they've got piles of comics that kind of make sense, you know, and got it. that never happened for me. Um, when I was a little bit older in elementary school and then the Ninja Turtles happened, maybe in like probably second, third grade, I guess it was third grade. Um, and then, you know, I, I started making like Ninja Turtle ripoff comics. Um, but, but you never were creating like your own personal universe where it's like, this guy has this power and this guy does that thing. You were always just sort of emulating yeah, what you saw. Just, just kind of taking stuff in and, and digesting it and mm-hmm. not understanding how to make it work. And, and I would always go to, when my mom went to the mall to like, for clothes or whatever, I would just stay in the bookstore the whole time and just look for comics or books about drawing. And so like all of those really horrible, like cartooning books that were like remaindered from the fifties and sixties and seventies. <laughs> Did you, you know, have those, the big ones that like were. All of, oh um, yeah. All of Foster, them. And I had, Robert Foster or something. How, no, how, how, Foster, how no. Foster's That's, Prince Valley. Yeah. How Foster. Yeah. No. Um, but, I had I also had my dad's like art books like that like the big the big giant ones like that like how to draw the human head and stuff and of course those are way too advanced for for <laughs> me but um but I'm specifically thinking about like those really bad how to cartoon books that were like like you know dashed out by people that you never really heard of like or like British British newspaper syndicated guys who would do these you know everybody the, the cartoons just they weren't fun to look at. They weren't funny to like. I would read them and I'd be like, "That's not funny. How does this guy do that?" You know, and um, that 
yeah, that was kind of thing. And I did before before I get into the the video thing that we we discussed <laughs> earlier. Um, I can't find the real one, but I do have this comic that I did with my friend Jeremy in third grade. Oh, wow. an Ninja, it's a Ninja Turtles ripoff comic called Party Animals, and it's this is a photocopy of it because I. So there's there's the written writ, written version. This was done for school. So like anytime there was a writing assignment or something that I could get away with drawing instead, I would do that. Um, but yeah, so this is this is party animals. Oh my god, look at that! Look at the the knives as the part of one of the letters. Uh-huh. There you go. And so you you drew this completely, or you guys we, shared we drawing? Both, we both drew it. Got it. Um, there's no telling who drew what really. Um, I'm oh sure yeah, or it's illegible, but it's supposed to be farm animals. But none of these animals you would find on a farm. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a scientist who turns into a raccoon. There's a bird who turns into a person, and it says a bird is human. <laughs> Exclamation point. A horse <laughs> was human, and a rat was human, and. A bunny rabbit was human. And I think there was a bulldog, too. And they got weapons. Oh, yeah. And then they left. <laughs> then they left. <laughs> uh, their base, they had a base in the water, which is like a big octopus thing. Oh. Yeah, so I should redraw this is what I should do. <laughs> um, this is great. The bird is dropping, like... What are those little things that Raphael had? Size. Oh yeah, size. The bird is dropping size down on a, a bad guy on the ground, and he's saying, "I hope I don't kill him." <laughs> <laughs> I guess we didn't want to get in trouble, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that that's the kind of stuff I was doing early on, um, and it it also got. I had a I had a friend whose older brother had like the Black and White Ninja Turtles comics, like the Eastman and Laird comics, and that blew my mind because it's like i I just knew the tv show sure and i was like they've they're actually using their weapons in the com and like you know like (laughs) they were very different properties yes yes they were and they were black and white which was just weird as a kid as a kid you know even the he-man comics were in color so this was you know it was like this weird foreign object thing yeah, you just you don't you you can't sort of reconcile those two different things as a kid. Yeah, and Kevin and Peter both play a part into my later story too. So, so now hit us with the hit us with the videotape story because this is very funny. The videotape story is um, I was in that same time, pro, second grade, third grade, and there was um, I I guess I found out about it just by seeing it in the store. But there was like this how to cartoon kit because, like I said, I was looking for that stuff, and it was it was called the Bruce Blitz How to Cartoon Kit, and Bruce Blitz was a pub like a public access TV show host cartoonist guy with goofy hair, and um, you know he he would sit and do these goofy drawings, and but he had the the kit had like a book and a videotape. And it had like some stuff you could trace, and it had a pad of paper and a pencil and a pencil sharpener and a pen. And it was like, oh, that's everything you need. That's this it. is a very low tech career. <laughs> and and um, it actually it, it actually can be. <laughs> it can be, yeah. And which is a perk of it. Um, but yeah, I wanted that thing so badly, and it you know it was like twenty bucks, twenty five bucks, which to a little kid is you know a million dollars. Um, and I begged my parents for it and they wouldn't get it for me. They were like, well, you can save up and get it yourself, which as a kid, I detested, but really anything that I really wanted badly enough as a kid, I saved up and got like, they taught me how to do that. You know, like my other friends would get all the stuff that they asked for and I had to like work for mine. So like I did this, I I remember getting a scooter and like my mom was like, well, you can put it on layaway. And I remember saving up money to get the scooter and i couldn't have it yet. i couldn't have it yet but it's like just waiting waiting waiting, waiting and waiting and get it and, you know finally get the thing um and so they did that for this cartooning kit and the way that i got money if this is of interest to anybody 
was I living in at this point in Massachusetts where you can do the um, you get the nickel uh, the recycling deposit back for your cans. And so I would go around the neighborhood and ask everybody for their soda cans and beer cans, like any cans that they had bottles and stuff. And there was a gas station up the street or a convenience store. Um, I don't think it was a gas station yet um, called Sattler's and they had penny candy, which was very cool. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're earning a nickel at a time, that's five pieces of candy. <laughs> probably the last, heads up. Probably like the last place in the country to be doing that, you know, because the Mr. Sattler was like a thousand years old. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, that candy's from 1942. It Still tasted, good. <laughs> it tasted like it. But so I would just drag these like garbage bags around the neighborhood and go and then drag them to Sattler's and cash out and save up my my money and get the object of my desires, which in this case was this Bruce Blitz video kit. So eventually I got it. And I, it, I you know, I walked, I probably wore the videotape out because that was the closest I had to somebody sitting down and saying how to draw stuff. Um, and it was very basic, very simple stuff for little kids, you know. Um, had really, you know, like had really bad music. It was everything about it was basically <laughs> awful. No offense, Bruce. I thank I thank you for your your, your efforts. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, but that that was like you know almost like the Bible for me as a kid because for a while because that's like what I had that was showing you how to do stuff. You know, yeah. it's like you can do this and you get a nose and you can do. Nice. And it's and it's real time as opposed to like looking at a book where you're like you know you kind of yeah, have exactly. to sort of choose your level of interaction and and you could you know do it again and I I remember drawing like there's one one of the first things on the video was like a guy on a surfboard and he's like that picture is not funny let's make it funny and he just drew like a shark jumping up behind the guy and like the shark was like lunch and that's the jo you know like that's the that's joke. The joke. And, which is like a non-starter joke, but it's like it gets the concept across. And it, but I remember drawing that like over and over and over again, like trying to figure out how he did it, um, because I could watch him do it. So it was very helpful, you know, for hmm. what it was. Um, yeah, and then the the part of the story that you're looking forward to is down the line i don't know if you want me to jump to that yeah why, why don't we just jump to that because it's it's kind of amusing it's yeah it's it's amusing and heartbreaking at the same time so i i uh at this point we were living in arizona um i was about to go into ninth grade so my first year of high school um which turned out to be my last year in public school uh seventh and eighth grade um, I had slowly started to lose. I mean, I never was really interested in school the way that you have to do it. I like learning, sure. but um, seventh and eighth grade, I started to stop turning in assignments and stop paying attention um, because I would kind of get ahead and then I would just be bored. Like I'd be like this, I just waiting around for the whole year to like, I just like, can I just take the test? And they're like, no, you have to take it with everybody else. It's us. Okay, whatever. And I just kind of wrote off the whole experience. So in eighth grade, I basically didn't do anything. Like I, I started, <laughs> started like my grades just like plummeted. Like I just stopped trying. Like I was like, plus I, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and so I was like, you this don't is since third grade. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so in between, in order to get into ninth grade, I had to take summer school because I had failed stuff. <laughs> And and it, the one thing that made me interested in doing it was it was a brand new high school. It was walking distance from our house. So it's like, I don't have to get on a bus or anything. I could just walk to school in the morning. Everything was new and fancy. And they had a class in the course, the course book for the school called like intro to cartooning. And the little, you know, two sentence description said like with emphasis on comic strips and comic books. And I was like, I have a class that I'm excited for. Um, and then it said only for juniors and seniors. Oh. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I totally like I begged and begged and begged and 
we went and my parents had me go and meet with like the principal of the school and the art teacher of the school and I brought drawings and stuff and like I basically tried to like plead my case of like you've got to make an exception and they're like but you're failing all your classes why should we make an exception I was like I won't fail any classes if you put me in this class and so I aced summer school didn't didn't miss a beat like straight A's all the way through so pumped I'd never been so excited to start a school year in my entire life first day of school roll into the intro to cartooning class so very excited I can't understand like I can't I don't overstate I can't overstate how excited I was as a as a kid to this class I get into the class there is this little lady looks like a regular you know like just a generic high school art teacher lady she goes and she talks about comics and how exciting they can be and then she says we're going to get started off for the first couple of weeks with this introduction um and she pops in a videotape and um because cutting edge technology back then was like the little vcr built in the tv thing in the classroom you know yeah pops in the videotape and up comes how to cartoon by bruce blitz it's the video that i saved up for in elementary school and i was like are you kidding me and then I was done. I was done with school. <laughs> and my parents knew. Checked parents, out. They knew there was a problem because I got an F in a class called How to Cartoon. And they're like, there's something wrong. And so ultimately I ended up, <laughs> excuse me, doing homeschooling for my last three years of high school. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so that's that's my story. Yeah. Such a tragedy in and some it, ways. Yeah. Most so, <laughs> oh, man. yeah. Okay, so um, you're night. You're doing homeschooling. You're. Are you now? Do you ever get into reading comic books? Like, yeah. like buying, reading, collecting piles of comics everywhere. Does that happen? Yes, um, inter intermittently. So, like going back to Westfield. Yeah. Um, the Dick Tracy movie came out with Warren Beatty. Okay. And I I loved it. I thought that was amazing. And that mm -hmm. and then I was like, oh, that's a comic too. And so like I love Dick Tracy. And then like, you know, Chester Gold's comic was like super weird and crazy. And there was there was like there were no comic shops really around, but there was a flea market up the street um, uh -huh. on weekends. And there was a dude who had comic books at his flea market and he had like Dick Tracy reprint comics and stuff. And I couldn't, I never bought them. Like for whatever reason, I didn't have money on me there, but I would sit there and read them. Like I would just go up and read them. He didn't care, you know, like he would just- He's like, like, whatever kid. Yeah, he's like, they're, you know, let well, this kid read comics. I think my mom might've worked. She had like a part-time job at a grocery store for like a minute there. Cause she was bored at home and wanted to earn some money and do something out of the house. And it was where this flea market was. And so, like, I think I went when she was working is how I was there or something like that. Like, I would go hang out and look at comics. And then... So indoor flea market or an outdoor flea market? I remember it being indoor because it was like a it was like a shopping center. But and it, was might, it... it might have been outdoors. I, I, I can't remember. Was it an antique sort of flea market or was it just a junk market? Probably more on the junk side. Okay. I, but I didn't pay attention to anything except the guy that had comics. So I Got couldn't it. really tell you. <laughs> she was um, like, there, boom. Yeah, so I would read those. Floor. And then um, my friend Derek, who lived a couple houses over, he had, like, superhero comics. He was a big Punisher fan, so he had all, like, the <laughs> Punisher war journals and all that stuff. Um, you know, so I would borrow that stuff from him. And then my, um, my parents got me. I grabbed... I think it's over here. For Christmas one year, my parents got me the How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way book. Okay. So this was something else that I remember trying to copy. And again, like superheroes was never my thing. Like I didn't I didn't really buy into the superheroes as much. Like I I like Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts. They're very different from this. Yes. Um but I nonetheless I spent a lot of time with this book as a kid. And they got me, you know, with that, there was a couple of random comic books that they got. There was, like, a Batman comic and, like, something else that they were probably like, well, it's comics, you know? <laughs> and um, so I had that stuff kind of floating in and out. And I had my dad at some point 
before we moved to Arizona, found a box of stuff from his youth. And there were some comics in the bottom of the box that didn't get thrown away with the rest. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, he had he still had his uh, Magnus Robot Fighters. Okay. Which I have those now still. And then there was like a couple of random, you know, Classics Illustrated and stuff. And an X-Men number one, which he still has. Um, like an X-Men, <laughs> X-Men, like the Marvel. Oh, wow, that's yeah. great. It's kind of beat to crap, but it's, you know... It's there. It's he still has it. So I made you know I told him as I put it in the little case and it's uh you know he's got it. But I've got you... all the Max Robot Fighter books. So like I had that stuff to look at. And then he also had um he had a, a handful of like heavy metal magazines that had comics in the back which weren't for kids, but he let me look at them anyway. Um just because it was comics. And he and there was a I, there's a, like a Mr. Natural book, like a crumb, you know. <laughs> That again, I you know I shouldn't have had access to that, but it didn't didn't really matter, because um, I just like the you know drawings like big nose and beard and riding a scooter on the cover, you know like whatever goofy is weird. As I knew it was weird and off and different. Um, that those were like you know, and I didn't know that Crumb was like super famous either. Like I was just like some yeah. weird weird thing that my dad had in the basement from before I existed, you know, like rem remnants of another light kind of thing. And um, and then when we were in Arizona, this is when the comic book started to happen, like the, the pivot, because Wizard Magazine started. Mm. Um, and I had friends in junior high that would read Wizard. And one of them um, gave me gave me one. Uh, he said, hey, you should read this because, you know, he knew I'd was drawing all the time and i didn't you know i didn't know anything about what it was but i dug that out for you too uh, uh i think i had it in my hands this afternoon <laughs> uh, i got too much stuff i dug out a lot of stuff here we go this is july 1995 okay so how old how old would you have been at that point this was in arizona so i was in junior high okay uh, um, and it's got Judge Dredd on the cover, probably because <laughs> the Lone movie was happening. That's, that's what I would guess. Um, but in this issue was an article on uh, Trent Canuga, who was this 17-year-old kid at the time, still in high school. So he's like two or, two or three years above me, you know? And this was his comic book, Creed. Creed, Okay. Way before the horrible band Creed that everybody <laughs> associates with the word Creed. Um, <laughs> and it was just like, you know, pictures of him drawing at his desk in school. You know, like he was doing this book that was being published um, by a small press comics company um, in his hometown. And he was just a few years older than me. And so like the light bulb went off that was like, you can draw comics about whatever you want, like comic books. You can do them about anything. Um, and you can do it at any age. <laughs> and so then I was like, if he's doing it, what do I have to do to get to that stage? And then um, simultaneously to that, one of my mom's friends at church gave her an issue of a, a like a Christian teenage boy magazine called Breakaway um, okay. that was like, you know, interviews with like Christian rock bands and stuff. And um, and they had a, a feature on another teenage artist named Matt Martin, who was also just a few years older than me, Move over and who, who turns out was friends with Trent and they worked together <laughs> on a lot of stuff. And Matt, Matt ended up doing porn comics and stuff later on and get, like, he got he went <laughs> went down a path went down a path trent did trent ended up going into the video game side of things and designed a bunch of the stuff for like world of warcraft oh and, like he does like video game character designs and all that stuff now so he's doing great he's in uh, the world yeah and i've got i you know we've never met in real life but we corresponded quite a bit um, oh okay i corresponded with both of those guys eventually um and matt i haven't heard from in a million years but uh 
but Trent, you know, we'll, we'll touch base every once in a while on social media or something. Oh, um, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, the crazy thing about comics is how how small it is. And so lots of these people um, uh, that were influential to me um, as a kid, I ended up interacting with later, um, including the Ninja Turtles guys, um, which so. OK, so yeah, Arizona, Wizard Magazine. And then there was a real comic shop near my house um, in Phoenix called Atomic Comics. And they had, um, so Bone was starting around this time. Like the okay. first of Bone. And um, so I would pick up that at Atomic Comics and anything that didn't look like regular <laughs> comics. Image was happening back then. And so like, sure. I, I copied all you know those image drawings because um, that's what my, my friends in class were wanting drawings of, you know, because sure. it was like, hot girls and guys with giant guns and stuff, you know, so it's like teenage boy nonsense. And so I would, I would do that stuff. And, but I, I didn't read that. Like I didn't read those comics. It's like the art was crazy and I would you know, be like, this is weird, but okay. Um, but so bone was more up my alley cause it harkens back to comic strips. And, um, but then I remember seeing like Sam and Max at atomic books. Okay, great. And, um, what else? Basically, just anything, anything that seemed out of out of the norm of like whatever regular comics was. I wanted not that. Like I wanted the other stuff. Sure. So so that was when I first started buying stuff, and and there was some horrible. Like I made some bad decisions. Like I remember buying because because my dad was um, had showed me Magnus Robot Fighter when I was oh, little. You know Bought you the know, new ones. Well, no, but I bought other like terrible Valiant stuff because I was like it's. You know, it's related somehow, you know, it's in the same thing. And so, like, I would buy that stuff and then be like, why is this not good? <laughs> you know, um, at least not, it's not what I was really looking for. So, like, yeah. um, and in, to, to Wizard's credit, in, they had a column called Palmer's Picks by a guy named Tom Palmer who would write about the indie comics and stuff. So, like, oh, okay. that's how I found, about, I found out about, like, Madman. By Mike Allred, which was a huge thing for me. That's Mike's stuff is the closest I come to being interested in superheroes. Sure. Um, and Laura Allred's coloring probably is a huge influence on my color palette. Um, yes, very, very seriously beautiful colors. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so that so I I bought every issue of Wizard mainly because it was the only thing that existed that was about comics. You know, and they did cover a lot of stuff. They covered a lot of garbage stuff, but they, you know, the Palmer's picks things kind of saved it. Like there was always something interesting in that article. I think they did they did one on like Chester Brown at some point, and like um, all all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Cerebus. Um, oh, Dave you know, Sam. I, yeah, which I I never. Yeah, <laughs> poor so Dave I, Sam. <laughs> poor Dave. Uh, <laughs> I never really read Cerebus, but I knew about it and I, you know, like I would look at it, you know. Um, it's beautiful. I mean, it's gorgeous. It, it's a gorgeous book at a certain right. at a certain point, you know, when Gerhard's working on it. It's yeah, gorgeous. it's crazy. Um, which that blew my mind, too, because then I was like, oh, there's somebody else doing this, you know, the background stuff and like all that, like trying to figure out the mechanics of how these things are made. Cause like you see the superhero comics and it's like, everything's broken down. And in the Marvel book, it's like, you do one thing. And I was like, but I want to do all, like, I want to do all of it, which. So you always, you always wanted that sort of newspaper approach where you're going to write it, draw it, ink it, even color it. You, you, mm -hmm. you thought that was what you wanted to do. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. And then when I, once I found out you could do comic books about anything, and th then I was like, okay, so I can do this format and do something that's longer, you know, or like comes out. It doesn't have to be an everyday thing. It can be like, I'll make a book and I'll put out a book. And then that became the new goal of like, what can I do in in that way? And um, and so when I was that age was when I started trying to come up with my own characters and stuff. And I came up with this horrible thing called Squiggles. Um, 
What is yeah. what is? I don't know if I've heard about Squiggles. Oh no, you haven't heard about Squiggles because I don't talk about it. <laughs> um, but you know, because this is this is a a deep dive. We'll get one t- one time only. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Burn after meeting. <laughs> I should probably. Oh, I don't have my pen. Can I run in the next room real quick? Sure, of course. Of course. Okay. No. Hang on one second. <sighs> We'll just, we'll do a little edit here. Oh, I'll do a little stretch. So we'll do another 20 minutes or so. And then we'll... Yeah, we're back. All right, sorry about that. I didn't have my, my Apple Pencil. I was going to, rather than just talk about it, it'd be easier to just draw you what this thing was. Uh, Todd is back and he's ready to do some drawing. Yes, that you'll you'll wish <laughs> probably. Okay. Apologies for that delay. We're back. Um, Todd has his trusty iPad. Yeah, so we were talking about squiggles. Squiggles. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> So let's see if the muscle memory works for this. So Squiggles was the result of a uh, one of the only assignments that I did in that cartooning class. Because like the end of the class was you had to make like an eight-page comic. Oh, okay. And so I was like, well, I'll do that because I don't care if I get graded for it or whatever, you know. And Squiggles was just this weird, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm drawing this. I'm trying to draw it how I. This is probably better than what I did at the time. But so this this was basically what squiggles look like. This weird. Oh, it's like a dude. Just this weird dude with bulbous eyes. Um, so I didn't I didn't put pupils I didn't draw glasses on stuff on people, but I I didn't put pupils in their eyes um, because of uh, understanding comics. I tell I tell Scott uh, when I when I later met Scott McCloud I told him this because like the stock boy doesn't have pupils in his glasses that's because of Scott's the way Scott draws in the, that book yeah so the way Scott drew himself had no um, no pupils now what year did Understanding Comics come out when I was out there in Arizona so probably oh, okay probably that so like ninety five ninety six I think so let's see here. It says 93. Oh, okay. So you so, yeah. you definitely had it in 95 or whatever. Yeah, oh, look this, okay. Look at this great bookmark. Oh, look at Mr. Toast bookmark. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was something else. I got at the... Um, uh, the library had a copy of Understanding Comics. And so that was something that I also took in at the same time that I was doing squiggles and all of this terrible stuff. I was digesting this academic tome on <laughs> on comics um but so yeah squiggles was this weird dude and the, i don't have the comic anymore but oh, there put, was, it, put it in the center put it in the center okay yeah there he is looking all horrible with his hands sticking into his legs like i guess that's a pocket um, i, I don't so, think it's terrible well the story the story was um he got he didn't talk like you never saw his mouth unless he opened it you know so he mostly was silent and he went up to the top of a hill and looked at the stars and a flying saucer came over and sucked him up and then there were all these little aliens and he started talking at them excitedly like oh my gosh this is amazing i always wondered if there was life on other planets blah blah blah. and he was asking them questions about everything he wouldn't stop and he literally was talking them to death so like the aliens were dying around him (laughs) and they and they the end of the comic was they threw him back on the hill because they couldn't stand being around him. He was just really annoying. And that was that was my comic for the class. Comic and number the, one. Yeah. And so the aliens had these these big heads. I think they only I think they only had three, like two two fingers and a thumb. And then they were like the three toed type aliens. So this is what the aliens look like. Oh yeah, the big-headed aliens. Nice. And then Squiggles eventually, like, I drew him for a while because I didn't have anything else to draw, and so he had 
clothes later on. He got like from Creed, like Trent always drew these like gigantic shoes and big hands and stuff. So like I I ripped that off. So he, everybody had these like big shoes and stuff. Um, and then even the so in like the later ones, the the alien um, one of the aliens gets stuck on Earth. And ends up living with Squiggles, and the alien's name is Dave. And so that that, that was okay. That was like the first thing that I had that was like a recurring. Character. Pull it back. Pull it back a little bit, and up. Okay, there we go. We see the shoes. Yeah, and Squiggles, it, he had a peace sign. Peace sign on the shirt. Probably. The then, Squiggles had a smiley face on his shirt, but his smiley face would change in every panel to reflect whatever was happening. So like his shirt would react. That was just okay. Like a, stupid running jokes that I had. Um, and so that was, you know, I would draw these com these comics that really were just, again, still kind of stealing from other stuff, trying to figure out how to make it work with these things that I had. Um, so yeah, that was something early on. And then there was, uh, when I started making mini comics, um, I had a character named Bobby Doodle and Bobby Doodle was like a, um, again, it was like a doodle. I probably have, I dug out a ton of stuff to show you. I don't think I... Do you not know Bobby Doodle either? I don't think I know Bobby Doodle. I'm just looking at what I was able to dig out of your stuff. And I don't think I've seen that. Uh, yeah, I dug out... As much as I could find. Where did I see it? I saw a Bobby Doodle today. This very day. <laughs> it's very... Oh, maybe it was in a... Oh, here we go. Well, it's in a newspaper. This is a newspaper article. So this is what Bobby Doodle looked like. Can okay. He was... The, the premise of Bobby Doodle... Also, I, I had this penchant for doing an obnoxious characters. So... <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Doodle was a the the premise of Bobby Doodle was it was a drawing that came to life and was just annoying. And so like the Bobby Doodle mini comics was just this little stick figure like screaming about stuff. Okay. Just complaining about things. Um yeah. This is a newspaper article from nineteen ninety nine. Found these two. I haven't seen this stuff in a million years. This one talks about my zombie. Um, okay, here's so here's what I look like with hair back in the day. Oh, look at that goldfish and Bob going on. Spider Man. <laughs> they wanted me to draw Spider Man because people didn't know what comics were if there weren't. <laughs> uh, here's a. This is later. This is 2001. But there's a journal comic in there too from that time period. Okay. And this Gosh. one has this one has the stock boy in it. So wow. Okay, that's so from ninety nine, um, but yeah, so so I started figuring out how to do story ish things, um, and I gave up. Uh, so while well, Bobby Doodle um, mini comics were happening at the time, uh, how old was I? I mean, I I was still in high school. I was, but um, Words and Pictures Museum in Northampton. Massachusetts. That was Kevin Eastman's comic book museum. So you've moved back. You've left yeah. Arizona, and you're back, and you're making um, mini. You're making photocopy mini comics. Who you're you're giving them to? Um, I'm get, I, I'm selling them. You're I mean, selling. I, I'm selling them for twenty five cents. I didn't know that. I didn't know that mini comics were a thing yet. I just thought. And this is a common story of it's like you figure out how to make a little book and you think that you invented it. You know, it's like, ah. um, and I, and the, the, how did I figure out that there were more of them? So like the, the internet was in its infancy, the internet as we know it, you know, was just starting to become things that people had in their houses. And, um, once I had access, to, we always had computers and stuff. Cause my dad was an engineer type um consultant dude for united technologies and so he always had computers we always had a computer in the house but like um once we got the internet at home 
I would go on and I would every day I would just search comic book, comic book, independent comic books, cartoonists. And I would also search for bands and stuff that weren't available. But like, and of course there was nothing, you know, like stuff was so rare to come up. But when something did come up, it was always another dot connected. And that's, um, come back to that for Harold stuff later. But like, yeah. uh, uh, Yeah. So Words and Pictures Museum was in Northampton, Massachusetts. It was owned by Kevin Eastman, one of the two Ninja Turtles creators. Um, and it was the greatest place on the planet. Like I, I miss that place to this day. Um, mm. He was is ahead of its time. You know, like I feel like if he, if there was something like that now, it would. I mean, there is. There's that Billy Ireland Museum in Ohio that I've never been to, but I would love to go to. Um, but Kevin's place was like a comic book Disneyland. Um, it it literally was. Um, it was a four-story building in Northampton, Massachusetts, which was about 45 minutes away from us. Um, and we were in Windsor, Connecticut at this point. Um, and Northampton is just a great town anyway. It's like, it's, I, I love Northampton. But um, Words and Pictures, it was like this, this four-story building that they, like, the windows had silhouetted comic strip characters in them against, like, a blue light. So you'd see, oh. like... And olive oil and like all all of the characters you'd see them like up in the windows from the street and um the ground floor was a comic book shop like you'd walk okay. in and it was it was a like but it was set up like a bookstore again ahead of its time like it wasn't set, mm-hmm. it wasn't like a comic book store it was like a bookstore was well, wasn't like a i remember the what this one comic store i went to at one point was just this they got literally the smallest space everything was painted black oh, and you just sort of go into this dark you know and it'd just be new issues i don't even think they had back issues there it was just it was sort of a satellite of like another store and it was just like i mean i loved it because it was just comics but yeah you as an them, experience but... it wasn't welcoming to a normal person right my, was... my comic shop in in connecticut that i went to was called buried under comics and it was run by this dude <laughs> named brian rest in peace brian um and it it was you know it was like that like those you just feel scuzzy going into them like but they're also great because you can find anything like you can just dig around and find magical things um but yeah so words and pictures was different like right from the get-go it was this really fancy bookstore looking comic shop but then um you go past the the checkout desk and there's a hallway and the hallway is a cave like it was literally like a sculpted cave like going into a, like like you're gonna walk into a cave entrance and then set into the walls were just like one of the one of the the um like a predator from the movie was like in the full like the, full scale like a life-size predator was like in a glass case with like a bat like a light coming from behind it in like this thing and like you go through and there's all this cool stuff and it like kind of twists around and then that's the elevator at the back of it. And then you get in the elevator and you go up to the top and the top floor was, um, I might have them reversed. I think the top floor was the permanent gallery, which was stuff from Kevin's collection. And it was, I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was like full, like Windsor McKay, like um... any anybody you can think of like full size like paintings and com- like giant comic book pages like Frazetta stuff but like everything you know that you see in the in like the collections of books like like this is a great comic book artist so you should learn about this and there was something from them there you know like um like Howard Chaik and stuff was there and like all the people that Kevin was buddies with had pages in there and and um uh simon beasley like oh ev- everybody had like and so it was and they were in these like gilded frames like it was a, you know like this giant epic way to view comic book art um and so as if that wasn't enough um level three like you'd go down and level three was the rotating gallery and every month or every other month they would have a show Maybe they're longer than a month. Um, but I would try to get my parents to take me there like once a month. Um, 
because it was heaven to me. Like it was just the greatest place. Um, and the rotating gallery, they would have different guest shows. So, like the very first public display of bone art was there. So I met Jeff oh. Smith there and like the artist, so the artists would come um, to the opening nights, but I was still a minor. So I wasn't technically allowed into the opening receptions because there was alcohol. Sure. But I would, the gift, like the comic book shop at, at the museum sold my comics and stuff. Like I became friends with like the staff and like Matt, this, this dude, Matt Smith worked there and he's, you know, he's a working cartoonist now. He was like the, like, run, like the manager of the comic shop there. And, um, you know, I was just this like little teenage kid and they would be like, yeah, like, We'll sell your stuff for you. And I remember, like, they would send me, like, itemized little paychecks from the, the thing. Like, it was all official, you know? Like, it was cool. I'd get, like, you know, $5 from the Words and Pictures Museum in the mail with a little statement and stuff and, like, a note, like, bring us more Bobby Doodles or whatever. <sighs> and, um, hmm. but because I became friends with, like, the staff, I got to meet Kevin because he would come in and, and hang out. And he was, like, a super nice dude. And, you know, you'd never know he was in this, like, stratosphere of creators. You know, it's like there's not a lot of cartoonists that people know their names, like regular people know who they, their names. No. And he's one of them. And, um, and he would come in and he was super nice. And so Kevin would make sure that I got into the openings. Oh, wow. Um, and so I would get to go to meet, you know, all of these people. Um some of them are like friends of mine now, like Evan Dorkin and Sarah Dyer. I met at Words and Pictures for the, the first time. We were going up the elevator together and I knew who they were because I recognized them from Wizard Magazine. Evan Evan always had his uh, his bowling alley shirts at the time. And um, Sarah was the first person to give me a, a printed review of one of my comics in an Action Girl comic. Um, she reviewed the Stock Boy number one. Um, you know, and so like, those connections were being made. I met um, I met Joe Kubert there. I met Will Eisner there. Um, all all kinds of just just the things that seemed unobtainable were made real there. You know, it's like you could see you could talk to the the people and and you know and Kevin and my dad liked it because Kevin bought heavy metal. <laughs> so like. Kevin was the owner of Heavy Metal, which my dad loved in college. And so um, we went when they did they did the second Heavy Metal movie. Yes. And Kevin let my dad flip through his um, his concept art binder of all the stuff that was going to be in the movie before the movie was out. Oh, my God. You know, like he just had all these like paintings and stuff in this thing. And so that had to be fun for him, <laughs> too, I would guess. But, um, yeah, I, that that place was just like. The greatest. Oh, the second level. We didn't even do the second. Yeah, we never even got to the second level. The second floor was molded out to look like a New York City back alleyway with a pizza shop, a life-size master splinter from the first movie, um, also in like one of those glass alcove things, and the four turtles climbing up the wall. Uh, You know, like life-size. And then, and then they had drawing supplies everywhere, and they would have TVs that were showing like interviews with cartoonists, and like, and then, and they would also do these um, workshops where cartoonists could come and do a class, and so like what? I would do those when they came, and like they, you know, it was like, you know, Marvel and DC guys from from New York would come in and do like they would just talk about this stuff. Like, I can't remember who was doing it, um, like, you know. Uh, like Hellblazer and stuff, like whoever was doing those books, which were books that I didn't read, but I wanted to learn. So I would go and talk to all those guys too. But it was like, you know, like the Evan and Sarah and like those kinds of people. I met Kevin Smith the first time there and like Jeff, you know, Jeff Smith boned like that. That was, I couldn't even talk to him. I was so awestruck. Um, I handed him a cutout of like a pogo strip and I didn't say anything. And it was up to, like, Jeff just had to figure out what was happening in his head. You know, like, <laughs> you know, first first time seeing a real-life cartoonist, and it's Jeff Smith. Like, that's pretty crazy. Um, so that, that place was, that was, like, the magic 
the magic connection and everything was there and then it was gone thanks todd great stuff um this will be continued in part two and part three this really we go deep with todd so um look for that one and we will get to continue with his journey to be a comic book artist